Hello, guys. Thank you. And uh, it's a full house today. Yeah? Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we're going to start soon, and uh, we've just got a few things to say. All right, my name is Nekshun, I have to organize the event of Mr. Kapoor here. And I see a lot of new faces. Who's the sign is it? Okay, quite 30%. That's quite encouraging. So, thanks for coming. Uh, today we have a big house, and we're going to talk about a few things, and also a lot of big house. Quite exciting. Uh, before that, I'm going to just say a few things. Yeah, first, we must thank Wendy. Oh, I'm here for sponsoring the menu. <laughs> and uh, we are two tracks and uh, two tech talks today. Right? First uh, is from Buddy on the state of SQL based observability. Second, from uh, User Clickhouse from Aaron, the co founder and CTO at Coin Hall. And uh, he will talk about his use case of Clickhouse. And uh, without further ado, then I'll just turn over to Buddy. We'll start off the talk. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this meetup. Uh, my name is Pradeep. I'm a site reliability engineer at ClickHouse. And uh, my goal for today is to make you guys uh, replace all your databases with ClickHouse. No, actually, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so in this next 30 minutes, we will look at how uh, SQL-based observability is becoming popular and how Click ClickHouse helps in uh, make it work at very high scale. So at the, um, I, I am part of the SQL uh, ClickHouse team and I enjoy uh, trying out new softwares and databases. And in my free time, I, I picked a new hobby, chess. So I'm learning it. <laughs> um, so over the next 30 minutes, we'll look at a brief introduction about SQL and observability. And uh, then we will see how over time, these, these concepts are actually becoming more and more challenging um, as larger and larger amount of data is coming and, and how basically da different databases can solve these challenges. And we'll see a brief introduction about ClickHouse and how very big organizations uses ClickHouse to solve these problems. And then we will look at if you have to build an observability system from scratch, what all things you need to consider to decide what should be the right approach. And then I will give a short demo and then we'll go to Q&A. To begin with, um, as everybody of you know, SQL is a very old popular programming language. Um, this is the survey of uh, Stack, Stack Overflow survey for the recent 2023. And you will be surprised to see that SQL is the third most popular language. Um, and I recently came to know that SQL is actually a Turing complete programming language, which I never thought about. But, uh, it's becoming, you can see over time, databases are getting replaced, new and new powerful uh, databases are coming, but SQL is one thing which is common in all of these databases. Um, and then is observability. Uh, observability is very uh, contextual term. Like let's say if you say, if I, you need to add observability for a system, uh, it basically means you are trying to pick some signals from the system to know how the system is performing. And let's say you have a very big complicated distributed systems, which generally all of our systems are now distributed. What things you generally look at? And as you already know, logs, metrics are very popular, like very, uh, we are looking at these signals from long time. But recently, due to the trend in the microservices architecture, Kubernetes, Docker-based deployments, there are new kind of signals which we are picking nowadays. And traces is something you know, like is very useful when you have a lot of microservices running, a request from the customer actually hits a lot of microservices, then traces is very useful. And profiles is another thing which if you like a system level understanding of how system is performing, then profiles is something very interesting. Um, Generally, profiling is based on, let's say, CPU-based or memory-based, and profilers generally take snapshot of what functions are running in the CPU. It will do in a sampling way, like, like let's say, once every one second, and it will see what stacks are there in the CPU, and then it will give you, okay, this function is taking more time than other functions. So it, it can expose those informations. I want to give a brief uh, history about uh, SQL databases, like, so if you see like SQL world was, came actually 50 years back, 
um, I think the first SQL database was something which was later changed to Oracle database. So, but over these years, like various kinds of databases came. Around 30 years back, I think back in Berkeley, uh, somebody wrote the Postgres and um, Postgres, MySQL, MySQL, SQLite, all of those came at the same time. They are relational databases, but they are transactional, transactional in the sense uh, they provide strong guarantees to you. And um, they are, uh, because they are transactional, that also makes it slow, a little bit slow. And over time, as the internet boom came and like uh, the amount of data started increasing, there was requirement for like databases which can handle much higher amount of data which OLTP databases can handle. And that's when the OLAP databases came. And uh, I think Mac Microsoft um, uh, came with some OLAP database. But with time, I think new cloud provider concept of cloud came, public cloud, AWS, GCP. And these cloud providers also realized that they need to store this huge amount of data somewhere. So they uh, built their own uh, data warehouses like Redshift, BigQuery, and Snowflake is, uh, you might know already that it's very uh, popular in this space. But uh, the thing about data warehouses are like, you deploy some kind of long running jobs, which are batch processing, and you wait for it to complete and you get the end result. But over time, what happened is users want to process large amount of data and faster because the cost is directly proportional to how long time your code is running. So um, now there is a growing trend of real-time databases like uh, ClickHouse, Apache Druid, Apache Pinot, and there are so many new databases which comes nowadays in this space. Um, if you look at uh, how observability evolved over time, like earlier there were single systems where like, so observability term came from system engineering uh, where like you are monitoring what, how a system is performing, CPU, memory, disk IO, network IO, those level of observability metrics. Then actually when you deploy an application on a data center, then like you need to access all the logs. That's why centralized logging concept came and you might have heard of syslog, syslog ng or like r syslog. These are few very popular projects in uh, this space. Then Splunk came, actually Splunk solved these problems very well, but it was an enterprise solution and I think um, I think when Elasticsearch came, Logstash became the first uh, solution which tried to solve same problems as Splunk. And recently, like Loki from Grafana Labs, those are some open source solution. And there are so many open source solution nowadays. But um, over time, what they saw is like everybody is building their own kind of standards. There is no single standard which everybody is following. So recently, like you know, open telemetry is getting popular uh, in terms of what should be the data format should be. So that's how observability evolved over time. And you see like nowadays, lots of open source solution in this space. Now, if you see both the SQL and observability evolving over time, you will realize that data is growing uh, very, very fast. Like earlier, big data used to be like one terabyte, but now it's in petabyte scale. So there is increasing size of data now who will win is basically the one who can store these data efficiently in such a way that it costs very less and gives highest performance. So that's why SQL-based observability came because SQL databases are very mature uh, over time. So, so with this, I would like to give you a brief, uh, what are the challenges in this space uh, in observability? So in observability, one of the major challenge, before understanding the challenges, like, uh, I would like to show uh, how a regular observability pipeline looks like. So there are some producer applications who produces the signals like um, logs, metrics, and th there are shippers like syslog ng or open telemetry collector like who ships these uh, metrics logs to some centralized queue. This queue is required so that you don't lose the data, let's say in case your other data store is down and those uh, in those situations. Then there are some consumers who read these messages from the queue and then uh, they push those messages to the data stores. And um, then you have some kind of graphing libraries like Grafana, Apache Superset, and there is some alerting, alerting on top of this data. So looking at this typical observability pipeline, if you see now um, one of the major challenge uh, systems have is like high cardinality of data. 
like if you have worked with prometheus you know prometheus doesn't rec uh, recommend to use a uh, high cardinality data as the labels if you are using high cardinality data like it's very easy that your resources will go out of memory or like uh, those uh, you will end up using all the hardware resources so in this table you can see customer id is a uuid so it's it's different for all the users so definitely it's a high cardinality data while customer plan which is like only two values so it's a low cardinality data so this is one challenge prometheus uh, users also face generally another challenge you see is like uh, all these systems actually try to do pre aggregations like they find out let's say percentiles they pre aggregate those values um, what are like uh, they create histograms and those those all pre aggregations happens in memory so they use a large amount of um, memory and cpu so so this is another problem which you will observe in majority of the systems very often then another very important problem is multi tenancy issues uh, when you build an observability system definitely there are lot of applications lot of teams who are using these uh, observability systems and and it's very easy that one of your tenant actually misuses the observability system they put a lot more logs and you end up let's say all the tenants will get affected so this is a very general problem and we'll see how these problems can be solved and last but not the least all these reflects as cost so as the size of the data observability data never reduces it keep on growing always as the size of data grows uh, you end up using more hardware and more hardware means basically uh, you need more uh, hardware for processing the data more hardware for storing the data so it it definitely means more cost so once you see all these problems if you look at like high cardinality support like um so we need some data store which can give you basically infinite nearly infinite cardinality like you don't need to worry about your cardinality actually that is the perfect solution another thing is like when you are doing pre aggregations the database should be uh, intelligent enough to use it very efficiently so using the resources very efficiently maybe they can get slow if the resources less but they need to use the resources very efficiently then another thing which is become very popular nowadays and you see lot of vendors doing is like compute and storage separation and the reason why this is become very popular is let's say um, when you buy a hardware like server it is it has a particular specification like let's say 128 gb uh, cpu cores uh, 512 G gb ram and let's say your application you are deploying on that is only memory intensive but not cpu so you end up wasting all those cpu resources so uh, having this compute and storage separation basically helps you in making sure that all your resources are being utilized properly and there is a big trend like nowadays everybody wants to use uh, s3 object store as the main storage so you will see all the uh, database vendors uh, providing uh, object based storage to reduce the cost for the customers as well then we talked about multi tenancy and uh, true multi tenant systems are very tough because if you have to build a really multi tenant system you need to enforce like some kind of rate limiting quota um, or like priority but when you enforce these um, the the data may be dropped because you are now putting some quota uh, anything which crosses the quota will be dropped so you never know like you are dropping something which may be a point uh, like which can be some uh, which can give the developer some uh, help in debugging so um, but these are some of the things your data store needs another thing which is required is the efficient data compression as the size of the data is growing day by day like you need to have some way to compress the data and as you know like nowadays there are some general compression mechanism like zstd lz4 and there are some compression techniques which are uh, directly related to the data type like let's say if you do uh, there are something like gorilla encoding then uh, there is something called dictionary encoding so all these uh, encodings can apply based on the type of the data so um, last but not the least like um, um, is like your database should be able to scale up very efficiently from small data to bigger amount of data like which is, this is very tricky part because majority of the databases will not be able to handle let's say 
bigger than certain amount. Let's say if you use Postgres, if you push more data, there'll be more write ahead logs and then like it will reflect somehow in other places. So it's, it's, it's not a simple task. So based on the problems, now we see what are the things which a data store should require. And with this, you can say that observability is just a data problem. It's like observability data is unique data, but it's just a data problem. And what you need to do is like to have an efficient data store for this, which can handle all those cases properly. With that, I would like to give a quick introduction about ClickHouse. ClickHouse is actually uh, formed in, uh, started in 2009. Uh, it was built in Yandex um, and it was open sourced in 2016. Uh, it, is, it is becoming popular day by day and it's a column oriented database. I think it is one of the early column oriented databases. Uh, by column oriented databases, you generally mean is like uh, all the data in a column is stored together on disk, physical disk when they're stored. So um, in, let's say in Postgres, relational DBs, those are row oriented databases where a row is actually stored together on the disk. The benefit of column oriented databases is that they provide faster aggregations because let's say you want to do group by, you, you can read just those that particular column. You don't need to read the data for other columns. So it, it makes uh, efficient uh, reading of the data. Then it provides uh, indexing. One difference in ClickHouse indexes versus let's say Postgres MySQL indexes is like in Postgres or MySQL, you have one entry in the index for each row of the data. It's like, um, so your indexes can grow big as your data is growing very big. But in ClickHouse, you have one, one entry in the index for a, a batch of data, like 8192 is the default batch. So um, for 8,000 uh, rows, you have one entry in the index. So it's called sparse index. Some people call sparse index. Um, and then there is some concept of background merging. Background merges, uh, some, uh, some databases called compaction. In ClickHouse world, it's called merging, where basically you are compress, um, merging the data to provide it a format, like which is more efficient, can be efficiently queried. Then it's completely distributed in nature. So it has replication, sharding, and um, multi-master. I will not call it multi-master, but I will say there is nothing called uh, primary, secondary role in ClickHouse. Every node is equivalent. Let's say if you are one of the node goes down, something somebody else has the data, they can serve the queries. So um, this helps a lot because if there is primary, secondary, then if the primary goes down, you need to somehow make secondary as the primary, which can accept the rights, and those um, extra problems come. And it's an OLAP database. As OLAP database means analytical databases, it can do uh, aggregations. And one very important thing is all the data in ClickHouse is actually immutable. So once the data is written, those files are written like they are never modified. You, uh, when merging these things happen, all the background operation happens, New files are created, but existing files are never like rewritten. So that's make sure that the data is consistent um, and we can track any bugs by looking at the logs, what happened with a uh, data file, which we call parts. So um, this is uh, how ClickHouse is unique. I would like to go next at some of the real world deployments uh, of ClickHouse. And one of the early adopters of ClickHouse is Cloudflare. And um, I think back in uh, 2018, Cloudflare was looking for this problem, like how to store this much big amount of data, which they, they became suddenly very popular. And like, they are like serving like 10% of the internet, I think. Um, and they have a lot of analytical data. So they wanted to somehow store all this information and they were evaluating Postgres, uh, CitusDB, and I think Apache Druid and, at that time, actually, ClickHouse was open sourced. So they did a, a proof of concept and they found like ClickHouse being um, much more efficient than other databases. So they went with ClickHouse. And after that, they actually adopted ClickHouse for so many other uh, projects. Now, every analytical projects in Cloudflare actually uses some ClickHouse. So then uh, Uber in 2021, actually, they published a blog how they moved from Elastic search to click house for the logging centralized logging 
and one of the things they uh, the link is here like one of the thing they mentioned is like they get 10x compression like so click house compression is very efficient so they got like this is every everybody says like the data size has reduced drastically and same goes with uber and um, what they wanted to do is they didn't want to actually the users experience they didn't want to change so they built something called query bridge which they called and which converted the lucene queries which uh, elastic search uses to sql queries so this query was a query bridge was responsible for giving the same experience and um, and this was i think very nicely done and one interesting thing which happened in there is like in that blog they mentioned like they evaluated different uh, schemas and at the end they went with this schema and this schema is very interesting that they're storing all the data types in an array so uh, let's say all the you can see string dot names and string dot values they are in array and like array operations are very fast so they they can pick by the array index and uh, and let's say if some column needs to be queried very often so they use some feature called materialized columns so you can see bar dot string and foo dot foo dot num those are materialized strings they by materializing it means basically you are creating an index on top of it like um secondary indexes you can call so um that's how uh, they design the system um next is uh, ebay ebay in recent 2024 um uh, kubecon i i think um, they they said that they are using clickhouse for olap data store for tracing requirements and they published a detailed uh, architecture and as part of that what they see is the data compression actually data compression anywhere you will see like all the customers of clickhouse actually sees data compression always and i think in this uh, talk they mainly talks about deploying multi tiered uh, um hotel collectors and those aspects but this is how their architecture look like i think the trace store is completely uh, behind is clickhouse basically so uh, they talk a lot about open telemetry collector peering and those uh, but um overall uh, it's mostly same as any clickhouse deployment then we in clickhouse incorporation we also actually dog food clickhouse and um if you have worked with clickhouse you will know that actually the default logging level in clickhouse is actually trace level so by default we actually log everything because we never know which log will be useful when so um and that generates huge tons of logs and for us let's say if we use datadog in with that amount of logging level it's it will cost us millions so we decided actually to build our own observability platform also on top of clickhouse currently the logs are being pushed to clickhouse and they, we have a very big blog uh, a very extensive blog how we design all the com, uh, logging uh, stack with clickhouse and it it basically uses hotel collectors for shipping the logs and um, um hotel gateways and finally persisting in clickhouse so you can read about it more in this blog Uh, just to show like some numbers so we when we completed this project we found that actually we are taking nearly like we are compressing the data by nearly 17% so actual data size is like 19 petabytes but when we are storing and these all are stored in object store like we are not storing on disk so it's much cheaper in that sense but it's costly still um so but the you can see the compression ratio is really good and um, we are mainly using the otel stack and internally we call this project as loghouse so um, and we are using grafana for all the uh, visualization and um, ex for accessing those logs so let's say you need to build this um, observability solution in today's world from scratch uh, what all considerations you need to have and um, to have a good experience so first of all very basic thing is like what query language you need to pick um somebody say, may say that oh i don't like sql query language i don't know how to use it uh, i want to use some other query language but if you look at the domain specific query languages they are also not so simple and they are very limited actually so in this case if you have used elastic search query language the left side is elastic search query language and um you can see like it doesn't like it's not very readable like 
um so do you call this as simple query language query like i would not call but let's say if you want to do something similar on a sql it's very simple like you do okay group by order by and you you can get the average duration for each level so i i still am used to sql than other query languages but it's um very person to person thing then um another thing you you definitely need to consider is the schema basically in any schema oriented database like the way you design the schema actually matters a lot and uh, from our traditional habits like we we always think observability signals have different entities like metrics as different logs as different traces as different and then we find some common point among all these three but but if you think like do you need all these three separately or can you have something which is uh which you can call wide event or like um something like events which which can show all these informations in one one view so uh there is a very interesting blog about this i would recommend uh, you can read I, and then somebody commented in hacker news that actually facebook uses something similar concept like they don't have like metrics logs and traces separately but they have something called wide events and it makes sense like it reduces the cost so much because you have one signal you have to look at one place and, and uh, it's a very interesting blog i would recommend then uh, another consideration you need to take care is like how will you visualize those data and like for clickhouse we have plugins everywhere we have clickhouse uh, grafana plugin then we have good integration with apache superset then metabase or you can build your own uh, using the client libraries um another very important point is multi tenancy and actually uber mentioned in their blog that actually clickhouse multi tenants like they use some of the clickhouse multi tenancy aspects like you can see they mention like uh they they configured query parallelism and like they put rate limits and uh, accounting and workload isolation so it's very important actually you limit who can run like how much of the queries and how much cpu they can take and like um, from my experience in my previous roles also we you, we we had incidents is where some data scientists ran some query which ran for longer time because they didn't mean they need to put a where clause and they ran select asterisk and on a olap database it is not recommended like unlike uh, so uh, it's very important to put the right uh, limits everywhere another important consideration is like um, you know in the cloud there is huge amount of cost in the network transport as well so let's say if you are taking the data from one availability zone to another availability zone or one region to another region it will cost so um, you may want to have your deployment in such a way that you don't take the data out of out of that region and keep the data there but while query time you can basically have your query engine to run on all the data and like get the results so that way the data read is very less so uh, it also helps you in making like um, proper uh, failure domains so let's say if you have a availability zone going down all the data of that availability zone will not be accessible but other uh, availability zones data will be still accessible so this is one important consideration you you should consider and with that um, i would say like it is very important to have right data store uh, but it's very uh, requirement to requirement basis so let's say i have like 1 terabytes of data which i need to push into my observability system do you do you think you need to use the best or you can have something um medium level and like you can still do so i would say like it's always best to do your own uh, proof of concepts for your own data find out what is the right uh, data store for you but if you see here like one of the as i said like compression is always uh, one of the very popular thing in clickhouse then um then one another thing is like uh, clickhouse has very good integration with object store so let's say you want to store the data in the uh, s3 you can do it very easily it's apache license uh, you can just run it unlike other projects like where the license doesn't allow you to run so um, it has very good those capabilities and um overall i see like huge um pco improvements if you see 
So you can, uh, there's a very uh, interesting benchmarking project from ClickHouse, they call it ClickBench. You can uh, read about it. It is very interesting to like, it runs some 43 queries and those 43 queries test uh, different aspects of the database, like some test memory, some test CPU, some test network IO. So I would recommend in, uh, trying out that. Uh, with that, I have a small demo. Uh, so this demo is about a new feature which is coming in ClickHouse. And since you all came with the aspect of observability, so I thought like, why not to demo this new feature, which is yet not merged, but I think it will be very interesting. Uh, so um, so there, is a, in, there is a concept called table engines. Like when, um, when you create a table, you specify which table engine to use in ClickHouse. And the default table engine is called merge tree, which is the most popular. And uh, ClickHouse is now adding something called time series engine. So it can basically talk to in various time series formats. So the earliest one which ClickHouse is adding is called Prometheus integration. So basically, if you have used Prometheus, you know Prometheus has support for remote read and remote write. So you can actually store the data somewhere else and you can call the RPC calls to read that data and write those data. So ClickHouse is adding that support in time series engine. So you basically Prometheus will only receive the query, but it will just forward the data to ClickHouse and ClickHouse will store it. And similarly, when the read query comes, ClickHouse will give the data back to Prometheus. So I wanted to show a quick demo of this feature. Um, So um, I wanted to show you this demo, but if you're interested, uh, this is basically a pull request um, from one of the ClickHouse code developer. Um, and um, it's still not merged, but um, so it's, um, it's called this one, uh, add new time series engine to handle Prometheus protocols. And um, if you are interested how it is implemented, I would recommend you to read the code. Um, but like I have taken that branch and I have built it locally. So um, I will just run ClickHouse and it fails. <laughs> <laughs> so actually it says cannot assign the IP address because my network changed. So I need to see. <laughs> I think this is my IP, new IP. So I will just update the So it is now ready for connections. So uh, you can, I don't know if you can see, but um, there was a log line saying uh, it's listening on 8053, which is the um, 
this is the log line saying listening for protocol a uh, prometheus on 8053 port so it's now listening uh, the prometheus it can understand the prometheus protocol in this port so now we have started the click house but we need to start prometheus because prometheus will basically talk to click house so i will just uh, start prometheus locally and since the prometheus is ready uh, and it listens on 1990 so you can see that prometheus is running and it is talking to clickhouse i will show you the log lines but one of let's say we search some metrics uh, let's say prometheus build info it doesn't work i think i know because um, so what happened is like um, the tables are created before but they are talking uh, so we need to destroy the tables and we need to recreate them so um oh actually so so first we need to create the tables so in for that like because this pr is a experimental feature like times like anything in clickhouse goes first as an experimental feature so we enable this time series table and then we create let's say we create a table let's say tbl name and we say engine as time series so this will create all the tables behind the scene and we can check the logs of the prometheus so you can see for till now like it was saying failed to send the batch so it was not able to talk to the but you can see that ip is actually still wrong so i need to change the prometheus ip also um you don't see any error means like now prometheus is able to talk to clickhouse and if you look at the tables you can see that there are some data metrics and tags table available so if we see do a select count so you can see the data is coming basically so um in these tables basically data is the actual data uh, met, um, there is metrics and tags you know if you have used prometheus there is something called tags uh, so we we'll look at that but now if you see that you can see the data um data is coming so this all data is stored in prometheus uh, sorry is click house and prometheus is just like a proxy and um let's say if we see other metrics yes uh, so they also started coming so this is one of the new table in pen which is very interesting yeah you might be interested in checking this out with that i'm good like uh, if you have any questions i'm ready to take it thank you for coming uh, yeah sure so you uh, question uh, so i understand your product is the database itself right right um and i guess you, you discuss a lot of um, examples of uh generally top metrics right on a large scale right so i'm trying to figure out what is your uh what is your target customer client i mean for example you see you know, the kind of idea right so right. i'm saying like people doesn't doesn't do kind of actually maybe we do 
between turbines right. from here. Um, yeah. And even then, uh, like you talk about metrics, we, we do cap it, right? Yes. So, I mean, I just want to understand what, what kind of customer are you looking for that would be the ideal customer for your product? Like you, you brought up Uber or eBay, are you, are you, are you targeting them with something with extremely large um, housing requirements? Uh, I'm just trying to figure out the, yeah. the use case behind the product. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. So basically, the database is open source, Apache licensed. So all these big companies I named, they are running their own uh, stack of ClickHouse. We are they are not using our cloud product. So we have an open source version, which is Apache like Apache Two licensed, and then we have a cloud product which we call ClickHouse Cloud. And let's say you don't want to run ClickHouse yourself, and you want somebody else to manage it for you in the best way, then they come to us. But all the companies which I named, they are mostly in their, running their own bare metal um, click house clusters. So um, we, as a, as a database, we don't, like, we don't have like special opinions about like somebody need to come to the cloud, they can run themselves as well. But there are, there are few things which we do very differently in the cloud. One is like, we store everything on object store. So Let's say if you have petabytes of data, that um, the cost of running that storing that data will be very less as compared to if you are running your own um, in your own infrastructure. So, um, so what, what's the cost model? I mean, yeah. uh, you must be earning money somehow, right? Yes. Uh, first, you want your company to survive, you use a product. Right. You want to make sure I understand how you're making money. So, right. Okay. You <laughs> yeah. Um, so, for us, like the we have a cloud product. So somebody uses that cloud, it's like it's like on demand. So you want the cluster, it will bring up, we will bring up the cluster, it will come with a very minimal uh, resources. Then as your re requirement increases, you start utilizing it more, your cluster will get auto scaled up, scaled down, will provide all, it can even, it will even stop when you are not, it is not receiving any queries. So like it can do things very, um, so for us like, um, so our pricing, like this is the one one source of the like uh, getting the. Um, apart from that, uh, I don't know. Uh, are you looking for something like what we do exactly? I think this then really if uh, like I mean, it's, it's kind of a stage of product, right? right. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how how what what I'm trying to the use cases. Yeah. So basically, it's a general database, like, but which is very, which does thing very efficiently. Like I said, compression. It does compression very efficiently. Let's say you need to ingest lot of like terabytes of data. It will basically take those terabytes of data within few seconds. So what I'm trying to say is like, the data is doing things efficiently. But the use case is very broad. So because this talk was about observability, so I was showing all the observability related use cases. But there are customers who use it for not, like let's say if you have crypto, there are a lot of crypto companies. When they come to ClickHouse, they realize, oh, it's so fast. And like it's so, so many of the crypto companies use Postgres. And like when they come to ClickHouse, they see, OK, one machine can actually take the whole data of crypto, like um, blockchain data. So it, it's basically. Our customers are from different use cases, but I was showing observability use cases here more. I'm going to have a pretty big question. Well, um, how much are you in security? I'm not in sale. The sale guy left us here. I'm trying to sell off. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> anyway, uh, we don't discriminate. You have big data, you have small data, we take all of it. Um, and with a very cheap price as well. So you mentioned three terabytes. I have up here basically the pricings. You know straight away how much you spend a month. So if you're just storing it, it's 40 bucks, that's it's like what three coffee? Actually in Singapore, maybe one coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if you have if you query like 10 hours a day, let's say easy time, right? Um, yeah, that, that's how much you spend. You know it straight away. You can configure it to you know, very detailed, like 24 here by RAM, 48, 96. Obviously, it goes up as you scale up. And then, you know, there's the custom 
as well. Like if you want more, you can talk to our sale people and they, they give you the price. But you, you estimate your, your cost. And then we call in all sort of cloud vendors, so AWS, GCP, Azure. Uh, and obviously, because of the cost of running it, it's different. So you can, you can see the different um, Azure is very costly. I don't know why we invest in that. Um, yeah. And, and different uh, per region as well, 100%. So, uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Don't, don't, don't store your data in, in Germany. It's a lot of money. Um, but what I'm saying is, like, you know, we, we don't discriminate. Uh, bring your data, big or small. The, the important thing here is that we can scale up as your data grow. Uh, it doesn't matter. That doesn't have to be matrix, trace, can be anything, can be any logs. Um, yeah, so that's that's all for me. Security yeah. logs. Do you want to turn on operation? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I just want to say. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, if your data is compressed, boom, there you go. Um, so why let's you, see. Why are you doing that in the three reasons? Whereas a data person. Impressions. Yeah. Let me have a look. So you're not available in all the uh, regions with the available in GCP and Azure? Uh, yeah, so we, we have more regions for AWS, but yeah, definitely GCP and Azure is limited at the moment. Uh, you know more than me in the term of regions. <laughs> Are we scaling up more regions and how quick could we spin up a region? Actually, um, so we spin up regions when the customers came. Like we don't because running an empty region also is cost like cost something because we need uh, all the other components to be deployed there. So uh, like you are seeing Azure very less number of regions because Azure is the newer, near, newest one. Like it's it's I think one month only we have launched it. So can I buy a DCI system and I can call this on it? Yes, yeah, like you can download like Docker image or you, you can build it yourself and it's completely open source. I, I, I want the form. I mean, you guys can support on the form. Yes, we, we support yes, form. We, we, I'm also support so I'm the best person to answer the question. Uh, yes, we, we do support uh, on prem, but uh, these days we try to uh, uh, encourage um, customers to use a uh, hard version, right? Because you got everything covered because if it's on prem, then you need to uh, think about HA, you think about backups, you think about security for sure, right? But on cloud, everything is covered. Um, we even give you bonus um, features, including idling, right? Idling, you don't pay anything for, for compute. You only pay for the um, storage, which is very cheap. I mean, compared to compute, right? So um, we also allow for scaling in cloud. Suddenly, you have a very heavy workload. Um, it's still up. Uh, your queries will, will be running at once, right? These are not the bottleneck. Um, uh, use on-prem, right? Because on-prem is rather rigid. Uh, your data volume increases. You need, um, uh, if you have a very, uh, what is called um, very cyclical kind of. Uh, Wait, uh, this uh, is my Right. Let's say during business hours, you get a lot more queries. One business hours, you get maybe nearly no more no queries, right? So that's when the average cloud should cost. You have on-prem. It's almost always on unless you shut it down. Uh, so these are the, some of the issues that uh, I, I like. But obviously, um, if you want to get started with Streetcast, download the binary, uh, it's open source, it's free. Uh, you can run it, you can run it on a, as a Docker container, you can run it um, as a single binary, have a server, um, you can have like very high, high I mean, therapy or uh, high PTS uh, from there. And I believe uh, all these digital client all is uh, operating in that kind of model. So, yeah, I'll, I'll get it. Yeah, we are watching this. Oh, well, I'm just saying that uh, you know, I'm using a single binary uh, and handling a lot of work, right? Yes. So maybe you can expand on that. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a long answer to it. Thank you. No problem. Yes. Is the compression an enterprise feature or is it a well? No, compression is a, it's a form of box. Yeah, so, so I hope I hope it's the table structure, right? So underlying you should have RTA for example, right? So um, you need to load package into um, ClickHouse. ClickHouse has a native data storage format. So, um, or you can keep it as RTA and then you can read off um, your wherever it's free stock, right? So that's fine as well. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't be as much. Uh, yeah, you, so either you do user select and then move your data into ClickHouse and store it as a format, or you can just read off RTA. Um, so both are supported. Yeah, 
क्या 